Yeah. All right, look at that. Thank goodness, because like I said, I hate doing that. So, listen, you've lived a, a very unique life, Bob, and a lot of it comes out in your most recent book, Drive On, The Uncensored War of Bedouin Bob and the All-Americans. Uh, it's a book that I'm, I'm definitely picking up uh, because I have so many friends who are, who are veterans and, and have been in combat situations. But this is the first time I've, I'm getting to the pleasure of speaking to a war correspondent. How in the world did you get involved, not only in, in journalism, but in such an extreme uh, area of journalism that you actually are putting yourself in danger? Uh, just naturally lucky, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You know, it, uh, journalism, I, it, it'll be 50 years of, uh, in June when I got my first newspaper job, 10 days out of high school, and I worked my way through college doing that. Uh, from a small town in uh, Pennsylvania, Uniontown, the southwest corner, and uh, I just kept going until I was a national writer for the Associated Press based in New York City. And uh, one day the boss walked by and said, hey, I want you to go to Saudi Arabia to cover the war. And I said, for what, two weeks, two months, two years? And he said, whatever it takes. And uh, I was on my way. Now, of course, when I got that assignment, I knew right away my job um, was to get as close to war as possible so I could write about it. Uh, because in the insane world of journalism, stories are best when the situation is worst and what could be worse than a war. And uh, through deft maneuvering on my part, I got... Uh, I got assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division and uh, went to war with them. Now, that in and of itself is an amazing accomplishment to just even obtain the permission to uh, travel and, and basically em embed yourself with the 82nd Airborne. What was their reaction to finding out that they were going to have you tagging along with them? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I'll be honest, straight up front, I was more than embedded... Uh, when, uh, when I showed up, the uh, uh, brigade commander, the colonel who was running the show, said, I'll take you to war, and you live like we do and go where we go, but you've got to join the unit. And he handed me the shoulder patches, the AA shoulder patches of the 82nd Airborne, and I said, okay, let's, you know, that's what i got to do, that's what i got to do. Now, it was a, 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 and this happened several times, but uh, you know, the Sar sergeant asked me, he said, uh, did you volunteer to be here, or did somebody order you to? And I said, well, I got the assignment, but, you know, like you guys know, the, if you're in the 82nd, you got to volunteer. I want to be here because it's the biggest story in the world. They, okay, um, are you getting any uh, extra pay? I said, no, but they did double the indemnity on my life insurance policy, so I got that working for me. Uh, okay, you're, you're going to war, uh, but you don't have a weapon. Uh, I said, no, I, as a civilian, I can't carry a weapon, uh, but I have this uh, portable typewriter, this combat Olivetti, and some notebooks, So I got and, a, and an ID card that identifies me as a civilian in the company of the U.S. military. And, okay. Unreal. If we jump, if we jump, are you going to jump with us? I said, absolutely. I'm here to go where you go and do what you do. So he said, okay, let me get this straight. You don't have to be here. You're not getting any extra money. You're not carrying a weapon into a combat zone. And if we jump, you're going to jump too. Mister, you're crazier than us. <laughs> At, you know, and you know what? From the outside looking in, it does sound quite crazy. Uh, because, again, you're jumping out of airplanes and you haven't really had the training to do so, right? No, but, you know, hey, uh, Walter Cronkite in World War II made a glider landing in Market Garden, and uh, there were some uh, uh, AP photographers who made combat jumps in Korea. Uh, now, uh, fortunately, I never had to test that uh, that theory, but uh, I made the tailgate jump in, uh, in in Iraq, but I never had to jump out of an airplane. So. Okay, so let's talk about that first experience, because now you're not only jumping out of an airplane, you're, probably, you're doing it in an area where there's extreme conflict. Uh, what, uh, what were you told, like, right before? Uh, what was that, Gene? What did you say? Sure, I was trying to figure out, what, what did did you make a jump with them? No, I didn't. I never did jump, no. I okay. Just ju jumped out of the back of a Humvee, the tailgate jump. That's all I did. Uh, okay. It was some... 
there was some disappointment that they never did get a chance to jump. I mean, this was a unit that drew the original line in the sand and then invaded Iraq, and they were convinced they were going to just jump into Baghdad and take out that big-talking uh, son of a gun who uh, who uh, made him spend seven months in the desert. Right. Now, l- let's talk about that for a second. Uh, you know, th- obviously there have been movies made about our soldiers in the Middle East and and the harsh conditions that they were in. Do any of the visuals that we've seen either in newsreels or in uh, cinema, do the conditions any justice? Absolutely not. I mean, if you spent, if you spent a day in that desert, nobody would ever call it a hundred hour war. It's like this desolation, this vast sea of sand, nothing that you're used to as, uh, as anyone who lives in America, uh, and and the heat and, and the way it just saps your strength, uh, you got almost you almost have to feel the grit in your teeth uh, and the heat of the sun and uh, the way your eyes squint under this harsh light. Uh, and then uh, you know at night in the winter time it got so cold it would freeze the water and you can't see. So uh, it was a, 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 a an environment of extremes and the, the only things that can live out there are scorpions and. Uh, and sand flies, uh, but yet there was a whole American army out there, and and you <laughs> in, included, right? Yes, yes. <clears throat> so the whole yes. American army and you. Yes. Was there ever a time well, that you? How... Go ahead, go ahead. Well, that's how I got the name Bedouin Bob. They said I adapted so well to the desert and living out there with them in a hole in the ground that uh, there was a major in the Airborne who gave me the name Bedouin Bob because. Uh, uh, I, I just fit in so well with them. And that's what he said anyway. That, that That's great. Uh, was there ever a time that you felt that your life was in, you know, immediate danger while you were uh, with the 82nd Airborne? Oh, maybe five or six times. Oh, is, oh, is that all? I laugh. I laugh. Uh, I, I'll always remember. And it was a Saturday, 26 years ago, when uh, we invaded Iraq and the main assault was going to start the next morning at 4, 4 a.m., zero dark, stupid. And uh, I dug a, a, a hole to sleep in. And, and I was trained by the Army to do this because I was an old draftee. It's six feet long, three feet wide, 18 inches deep. It gets you out of the wind. And you stack all the dirt on the north side. So if an artillery shell lands, it might absorb a piece of shrapnel. Uh, but if you take a direct hit, there's nothing anybody can do. However, all they have to do is shovel the dirt back on top of you because you dug your own grave. Um, that was the that was the night I accepted the fact that I was already dead, so that I didn't have to worry about it. I would just do my job and uh, and, and and get on with it. It was sort of like an out of body experience, is the way I described it. Yeah, you kind of have to put your your mind in another place. To, to, I guess, yeah. rationalize it, right? And then, then there was the time, and it was right after the ceasefire, and you figure everything's over with. Um, ended up in the desert uh, in uh, in a minefield that every time you take a step and you put your foot down, you think you might trigger something that's going to, you know, turn you into pink mist. So, oh, my uh, God. That was, uh, that, that was an eye-opener, too. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I can't even rationalize all this, and yet you're experiencing all this and having the added responsibility of trying to relay these experiences back to people who, like me, have no conception of this. How are you able to put, right, stri- it, how are you able to string two sentences yeah, together? Uh, the challenge at the time was, uh, you know, uh, you know, we live in this Twitter age, this instant communication. I had a portable typewriter under I was under operational security, so I would have to type up something uh, on a sheet of paper and hand it to a sensor who would put it in a pouch, and and a Humvee would drive it to an airfield, and it would fly back to the rear uh, for everybody else to use. Uh, And the average time, I found out later, was was three days. Now, that was the average during the Civil War to get something back from a battlefield, so... There was this tremendous disconnect, I think, between what was really happening at the point of attack and what they were showing, uh, you know, at the briefings and uh, with the news clips. So uh, um, uh, I always felt like I was a voice in the desert and you get lost out there, which is my prime motivation to write all this stuff down now in the book. Absolutely. 
Now, now the book is is available right now, right? Or is it available? Is, is it still to be released? Is it out already? It is out. Yes, and, Great. Uh, you can get it at uh, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, or anybody wants to shoot me a, uh, an email at bdvorchak at msn.com, I'll get you an autographed copy out. Uh, that's fantastic. And also check him out on Twitter at BedouinBob82. We're talking to Bob Dvorak about his new book. And let me tell you something. Uh, my co-host, Russ Gallo, who was actually in Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield, uh, is someone that is going to be very interested in reading Drive On, The Uncensored War of Bedouin Bob and the All-Americans. I just wish he could have been here for this interview. It would have been fantastic. We'll get his reactions after the interview. But, Bob, I, I do want to touch on one thing that's kind of an, an aside comment, and that is comparing, based on your, your decades of experience and, and where you've gone and what you've done, comparing the state of journalism when you were working for the AP and, and doing all these crazy things in the Middle East compared to the state of journalism these days. And one of the things I would like you to touch on is the difference in the trust level that people have now compared to what they had when you were out in the, the middle of the desert uh, doing things that very few people can be able to do. How, how, how have things changed so much? Is it because of social media, or is it the quality of journalists have just gone down? Well, that's a very good question, uh, and I haven't been asked that before, but it, it, it's a combination of things. One, the profession that I knew of being assigned to go cover a story to its conclusion then bringing it back does not exist anymore. And um, that's a condition of journalism, uh, newspapers shrinking and the number of reporters or experienced reporters uh, being out there. That that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, two, like you mentioned, social media with with Twitter and uh, the internet and instant communication. Uh, um, you, you know, the, the written word does not have the same worth that it once had. And, uh, and three, the level of trust, I think, uh, you know, like many institutions in the United States, uh, journalism, newspapers, uh, uh, people who write things down, uh, just don't, it, it, it's just not there anymore. There's just been, I, I think just so much distrust in everything that, uh, you know, who do you turn to as a source and say, okay, I can trust this person. And the other thing too is who out, who is uh, who uh, uh, what writer is out there with the troops is seeing it from the foxhole level is experiencing the same conditions that these people are uh, on the ground and I uh, you know I, I, I'm sure there must be somebody but boy I'll be darned if I know who they are it's just uh, you know it, it goes back to the tradition of Ernie Pyle the World War II writer who got down in the dirt and lived with the grunts and wrote. Of the, about the face of war that uh, wasn't being seen in the you know the headquarters with the grand sweep of maps and and things of that sort. Uh, you get a different perspective when you're uh, when you put yourself in their combat boots. I can tell you that. Uh, do you think that journalists are too worried about becoming famous themselves than they are about reporting the story? Uh, yeah. Well, anybody. See, my job in fifty years was to keep myself out of a story. I mean. I never inject myself, and I mean, you know, as a writer, there are ways to do that without calling attention to yourself, but now it's, uh, uh, yeah, I don't think that's possible anymore. It's, it's, uh, you know, me, 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 and look what I do, and I'm holding the mic, and I'm the scud stud, or or whatever else, and uh, uh, to me, the basic saw of journalism was to get the story, but don't let, uh, don't, don't put yourself into it. And, uh, like I said, that the profession that I knew was gone. That, that's all. I, that's like Pony Express riders or John Henry with a steel driving man. That's, that's all gone. Yeah. You know, listen, I don't want to end on a, on a bad note. I, I just, this, this book is, is going to be absolutely, I'm, I'm looking so forward to reading it. I, I really am. And the the one thing I'm looking forward to seeing in it is I'm sure that by becoming uh, embedded with this, with this group of people, these these extraordinary uh, people, that you, I, I'm sure that you had to have developed more of a a deeper connection, not only to you know service in the military, but to these particular guys. Can you talk to us just briefly about you know the the connection that you developed with uh, the people that you were re- really working with? Well, let me put it to you this way, Gene. There are 
airborne infantry grunts with wings on their chest that 